according to Megan, yes, we are still in Acts 1. Hallelujah. We're in Acts 21, actually, not 1. And you know what? So what? We can do this. We're almost done. But there's a lot in there we got to know. But she cracked me up when she told me that this morning. She was like, we're still in the acts? Yes, child. We can do this. Wow, okay. It's a holiday. And we chose to preach today for you. Well, God chose. If it was up to me, I kind of wouldn't be here, but yeah. He chose for me to be here today, so, you know, I got to do what he tells me to do. And it's hard, y'all. But when we last left Paul, he was in a hurry to go to Jerusalem. We were in chapter 20. Paul addressed the elders of the church in Ephesus. Look, I could say that word. Woo! <laughs> I practiced, y'all. He told, he told them, and I'm paraphrasing here. He told them in Acts 20, 19, 23, hey, hey, y'all. You know, I lived the whole, whole time serving y'all and with humility, humility and tears, you see what I've done. Even after... There's been many plots from the Jews toward me. And in verse 21, chapter 20, he says, I have declared to, be, to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in Jesus. I just want to do a side note right now because I just got to tell you all something. I could have done chapter 20. Bomb! Awesome! No! Pastor Nate had to do it. I could have done chapter 22. No! Pastor Nate has to do it. So I have 21. Because Pastor Nate was told I had to be stretched and work. So, yeah! Just wait till next time. No, I'm kidding. So... But, you know, let me tell you, like you heard Pastor Van say, you heard uh, Elder Mike say, 18, not, y'all, this is some stuff. This is, this is like some drama. This is like, what, what do you call it, soap opera. This is like, wow, like who, who lives this? Paul lived it. But, wow, this man, now in 21, like I kept studying, like, you know, I know, I'm weird how I do stuff. This is just me. I know when I'm going to do it. You know what? Did y'all hear him say amen? <laughs> so I, I, I know what I'm going to do. I read, I study, I read and study, but I still procrastinate. That's just what I do. And when I'm going through all the studying and the reading and stuff like that, I went, there's a lot of stuff here. Because when I first started, I was like, hey, nothing here, Pastor Nate. How do you want, what, what, what's in this? There's a lot of stuff here. See, I had to take the time to get in that word again. Doesn't matter how many times I read it. Doesn't matter how many times I think I knew it. This time is today is here. And God said, look what I'm going to talk to you about in 21. So I just had to put that out there. Paul I'm still in the end part of chapter 2022. 20, he said, um, and now compelled by the spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem knowing what will happen to me. Huh. Hmm. 23 says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So wait a minute. Paul knows he's going, and it ain't going to be easy. He knows that he's called to go to Jerusalem. And he responds, hold up, let me get my Bible. He responds at 24, however, 
I think he did it like a little attitude. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Can somebody give me an amen for Paul? Like he was like, no matter what, that's new my sermon. He was like, mm. so I'm going to say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace and for allowing me to do what you called me to do. I do it for you. And I thank you for all those who have ears to hear that someone here in-house, online, will get to know you better and open up more to you, that they know that you love them no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So Paul, he's determined. He's got a mindset. Paul continues to remind them to be on guard. He's like, before I go, I just want to remind you, you need to watch out. He said, there will be those who will come and distort the truth. Ain't that something? We all know how that works, right? We pick up in chapter 21, verse 1, and I love this, from, from the last verse, like Paul is about to leave. It seems like he does this a lot. He leaves because he's, he's got to go. He's got to continue. But he's leaving people he loves. And it, it says, when he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. Look at that love right there. That's love in action. They all knelt together and prayed for each other. They all wept, wept as they embraced him and kissed him. They were grieved because... They felt they weren't going to see him again. But what did Paul do? He still said, I got to go. As much as that was probably very emotional for him. You know, I don't know if y'all, but I never really thought of Paul being really emotional, except for very passionate, determined. But this tells me, like, you know, he was. And it made me start to think of, you know what? Most people that are very passionate have a lot of emotion, Right? It's just sometimes it might be more of the passionate side than the other side. And that's called balance, and we know how to take care of that. But I digress. So Paul continues to remind them. And it says, after we tore ourselves, the tore, oh, tore ourselves from them. Paul, leave it, he leaves because he got to go. He got to go do that uh, gospel. He has to go tell people about Jesus. So here's my question. When was the last time you had a no matter what mind frame for Jesus? I know. Now wait a minute. I had to think about that to myself because you know when I have a question, I put the question to me too. Um, what and when have I ever said, I'm going to do this for Jesus it's not going to be self-serving. Oh, is it? <laughs> I'm going to do this for Jesus so I can get them out of boys from everybody. That's self-serving. I'm going to do this for Jesus because I'm going to be like so cool in the church. They're going to like me. Nope, that's the wrong way. That's the wrong, wrong way. Well, I know, I, I mean, I don't know what y'all, but I, I'm guilty of that stuff of certain times in my life. Oh, I so know how to be spiteful. Anybody else? I know y'all scared to raise your hand, but look, I'll raise my hand big. Uh, I know I can be spiteful. I know I can have an attitude, especially when something's not going my way. That's none of y'all, right? No. No. Psh, really? I mean, anyone know seriously that I'll show them attitude? Let me give you, let me give you an example. So, 
Paul's like, I got to go. He's not trying to show anybody nothing except for the love of Jesus Christ and that they have salvation. No, see, I'll show them, me, I'll show them. That's usually like when something wasn't going great in a relationship, I'll show them. I'm going to do this, show you how great I am. I'm going to show you what you're missing out on being with me. Yeah, I'm going to show, look, you know what that did? That mind frame lasted for maybe a day or two, and then I was exhausted. I couldn't hold it because I was so busy puffed up on me and what I was going to do. I couldn't do none of that stuff because I was, like, tired. But here I am, like, those, those thoughts, those strong thoughts about I need that approval, I need that validation from that individual or at work, I need, you know, I'll show them I could do this. I'll show them, you know, there, sometimes that could be a good thing for like if I, when I had a boss to say, you know, you won't be promoted, oh, pfft, I'll show you. And I was, but that was pushing me. But then there's the other part, the negative aspect of it, when um, I make it about me. When I make it about not Jesus. <laughs> and I make it that, you know, I just want my ego. We all got an ego. And I've worked many years and I still got to work on that ego. Just ask my dove mom, hello. Um, but now Paul, he's doing, he is willing to do whatever it takes to testify to others. You know, sometimes I will shut down. I was and still am times not vocal about Jesus. How about you? The opportunity's there, but I don't know. I don't know how they're going to react. I don't know if that's, like it used to be when I worked at uh, Pier 1 that doesn't exist anymore. We weren't allowed to uh, pray or do anything of any type of religion aspect. But, you know, God told me, <laughs> guess what, I'm going to give you those opportunities. And I just happened to have one of my associates who also was Christian, and I just so happened God blessed me a lot. So whoever got that store right now, um, there's a lot of prayers in that store because we would pray with customers. I didn't care. I was on camera. I didn't care. I had customers that were really upset. We would take them to the side, and it wasn't about they couldn't get their mug or whatever it was. It was about their husband or, or their child or something, and we prayed for them. And it was such a blessing. And it took me a while to get to, like, is this okay? Because, you know, I always thought I was getting fired. So I was like, is this, is this okay? And then I got, no, do it. Oh, okay. But then that went away. So there's, are we missing a lot of opportunities that don't necessarily have to be vocal, but through action to show the love of Christ to others. Paul showed through his actions and speech, did he not? You know, there were three groups of people who warned Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Did y'all know that? There were the disciples of Tyre. That's verse 21-4. They urged Paul not to go. Let me see. Uh, finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. Though the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then there was Agabus. I hope I said that right. He was a prophet. He was very dramatic. And I'm going to pause there for a second. Can I tell y'all something? Do y'all know how dramatic the prophets are? For real, to get their, to get their point across? If you don't, I'm just going to give you a couple examples. So... Now, see, I practice this word, too. Ahea. Sounds right. Okay. <laughs> the Shilite. He tore his cloak. He was a prophet. He tore his cloak 
to demonstrate how Solomon's kingdom was going to be broken up in kings. He's like, whoa! Maybe like the Hulk now. That's what I'm thought about. Then Isaiah, now y'all, Isaiah was a bit unconventional. So dude, he was kind of naked and barefoot. And he was running around. Now I don't know about you, but that would catch my attention. be like, what's up with him? Um, he was to demonstrate how the Assyrians would humiliate the Egyptians and make them capture. I think that would catch my attention. I'd probably throw something on him, like, come on, dude. Then there's Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he was, he was you know, he was told to get a, a pot of clay. And he got the pot of clay, and he threw it and broke it. Did that not get your attention? Why did he just break that pot? Well, the reason why he broke that pot is to show how God would break the city of Jerusalem and, Ju and the people of Judea. So they're very animated, No. They're kind of animated. I don't claim to be a prophet at all, but I know I can be animated. Uh, really, Charlie? And <laughs> I got people, hecklers. And, but these people, you know, they still went on and they did what they, what they were told to do. Okay, so Paul, although the Spirit told these three groups of people, oops, I forgot to tell you the third group, the third group was um, the people, the people that are around, the groups of people, were telling them, please don't go, it doesn't sound good. Like, you shouldn't go, something's going to happen. Like, you shouldn't go. Well, here's Paul, he's like, and I think this, I think this is, this is my interpretation, and but stuff through I read is that I don't believe the Holy Spirit was saying, no, don't go. I don't think the Holy Spirit was telling them to go or not to go. I think the, that he was preparing Paul to go, not preventing Paul to go, giving Paul that choice to go. So, okay, no, wait. Okay, so Paul was being prepared. Here's my question. How many times were you being prepared and you kind of missed it? You were back, you know, when you think, you were being prepared for something, like something kept coming up for you. Something. It didn't matter who you were talking to, what situation. Something, like, that seems familiar. Oh, okay, go back. Something else came, and something else came. Hello. You're being told, uh, you're not supposed to do that, but like me, being spiteful, I'm going to do that anyway. I'm going to come over here because I know better. No, I don't. But... I get that choice. But in that choice, I got to learn by growing and moaning and whining and all that other stuff I did. Eventually, I got to prayer. Okay, just want to tell you, there, there was hope for me. Eventually, and I'm talking about sincerely praying, not whining and doing a bargain to God. If you take this away from me, I'll do this, I'll do that. No, it's kind of like, God, you know what? I'm struggling, and <laughs> please show me because I can't do it anymore. Like that belly crawling kind of, I need you. Didn't we just sing that song, I need you, Lord? Yes. Yes. So Paul had a choice. Guess, guess, guess what? In that, in that time that Paul was being told, don't go because the people are going to reject you and they're going to cause you pain, wasn't Jesus warned as well? Don't go. It's not going to be good for you. And wasn't he told, when, when he got there, didn't the people reject him? I'm just saying. Let's go back because I, I got ahead of myself. 2119, Paul gives ministry update to James and the elders. He seriously did. And, I, and when you're reading, like it's a little travel log. Was cracking me up because I'm like, hey, Paul, I don't even get to go out of Florida, and you get to go to all these places. And he's not, he doesn't have a cruise ship or nothing. He has no limo. He has, he's walking, or he has this, this boat that I'm sure it's not like a boat now, but you know, he did it anyway. I would have already stopped. I would have, like, dude, I got to walk. Forget that. <laughs> I ain't doing it. Give me a horse or something. I ain't doing it. I would already say, God, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I can't do this, Lord. 
But so on 19, 21, 19, boom, 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 here we go. I started at 17. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to James, and the elders were present. So James, James is uh, the brother of Jesus, and um, Paul greeted them and reported the detail of what God was doing among the Gentiles through the ministry. Well, this is where it gets a little bit sketchy, a little complicated, because Paul's all excited, he's telling his news, this is what's going on, this is what's going on, and they're like, that's awesome, praise God, but we got to tell you something. Okay, well, what do you got to tell me? Well, some people are saying that you're taking, you're taking Jews away from the Mosaic law. What? They're like, oh, hmm, I don't know. It says 20, um, ba, 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 ba. They, have, they have informed you that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live accordingly to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So what are we going to tell? What, so what do we tell? There are four men with us who have made a vow. So these four men, they did not have the means to pay. And so Paul paid for them so they can, so they can have their vows. And they, it says, take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there is no truth in these reports about you but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. Okay, so this is how I get this part. And I could be going really fast, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, <laughs> so basically, Paul is showing that the law could not function as a means of salvation. That's, that's what he's saying. And he's also saying, yo, you do you, boo. You know what I mean? He's like, you want to do the law? That's great. But that don't make you greater than God, before God. Hey, you want to eat, eat pork or whatever? Great. But that don't make you no greater. Just want to let, put it in perspective, y'all. You, you feel that, you know, you can't, uh, you want to keep the, the Sabbath and everything that the law, that's great. He's talking about diversity. That's great, and you don't need to talk anybody out of it. But everyone, it doesn't make you greater before God. Your salvation is only in Jesus Christ. So in verse 21, 25, the leaders weren't asking Jews to live like Gentiles or vice versa, but to accept to be unified spiritually. That made me think about our church. We might not agree on some things. Guess what? We won't. We don't want clones. Does anybody want to clone yourself? I don't. Well, I don't know. Jonathan said he did. But I don't. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I love diversity. Love diversity. Because I get to learn. I get to learn from you. You learn from me. I think it's, that's just all God's children. He didn't make us all the same. That's awesome because look at all the different faces of God. I just, I just like, I love to learn about cultures. I love to learn about that I can't speak certain languages, but I mess them up. But that's okay because I mess up the English language too. But anyway, I just enjoy that. I enjoy to learn that. I just need to be unified in spirit. You know what? I love you. You love me. What's that song? Um, and yes. <laughs> what is that? That's too funny. Um, people online are going, what are they talking about? Anyway, we're singing Barney over here. So that's not part of the scripture, but we just kind of made it that way. <laughs> he doesn't exist anymore, does he, Barney? I don't know. But anyway, yeah, there's no purple person in here. But I don't know. It could be. I don't know. So anyway, so the thing about it was, to go back, is just being unified and knowing who we are in Christ. 
we're not going to agree on things. <laughs> Let me see. And when Paul was talking, I forgot to say this point. When Paul was talking about be careful when I leave, he just wasn't saying there's people out there that's going to distort the truth. He was like, their people are in-house. Sometimes in-house can be worse than outside. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes in church, we can have the idea that, well, <laughs> I'm a better Christian than you <laughs> because I do X, Y, Z, and you don't. Or I do this. And you barely do that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying love them, love everyone, accept everyone for where they're at. And whoever's supposed to do what, they will find out once they open themselves up to the Holy Spirit. I had to open myself up to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in order to be used. That was so hard for me. And I know a lot of preachers that run the other way because we're like, uh-uh. -oh. But here I am because it's scary. It's scary because of what you're called to do. Because for me, I just want to please him. That's my, my fear. I'm not going to please him enough, but then that puts my human spin on it. Pastor Nate reminds me. That puts my human spin on it. That what I'm trying to think of what's going to be pleasing to God. Instead of just doing and showing and allowing God to to embrace me and love me the way he only does. I put that, that block up. I totally lost where I am. Oh, uh, 27. So verses 27, 28, there was the temple. I don't know if y'all know this. The temple was surrounded by three courts. And what I'm talking about is because, uh, Paul, let's let's retract, sorry. So Paul, as for the gentle believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat, or strangled animals, and from sexual immortality. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and offering would be made for each other. So now get sketchy for Paul. So this is where Paul is coming up to the warnings, the actual what's going to happen. So there were, there were people in the crowd that accused Paul of taking a Gentile into the temple. So there were three courts of this temple. There was an innermost court, the court of Israel where the Jewish men offer their sacrifice. There was a second court. The second court were for women and Jewish families would gather for prayer and worship. Then there was the outer court, and the outer court of the Gentiles were open to all those who wanted to worship God. Any Gentile that went beyond the outer court, beyond the barrier, he or she would be liable to death. So he's being accused... It says, when the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the providence of Asia saw Paul at the temple. Now, didn't we just see that Paul went to the temple? Okay. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us, this man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the te temple area and defiled this holy place. So now it's a fight. Now it's like, he was prepared though, was he not? He was prepared. He knew this was going to happen. He didn't know exactly how it was going to happen, but he knew this was going to happen. So now the whole city is in an uproar. 
Can you imagine that? The whole city thinking whatever somebody was saying, because we don't know exact words, but accusing Paul of taking Greeks in. It says, and the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. Can you imagine? Now, the way I remember, Paul's not that tall, right? He's, he's, I don't think he's that tall. But I can't imagine. It doesn't matter how tall you are. You got all these people coming from you all directions. And you're like, uh, I was just praising the Lord. I don't know what y'all are doing. But now they're like after him. They seized him and they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. Talk about some drama. This is like an action film. You know, this is stuff you see on, on uh, Marvel. You see, that, you see people rushing in. While they are trying to kill him, news reached for the commander of the Roman troops. And this is what I love because this is, the commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound. So remember, Agabus said, took the, belt and said he was going to be bound. The owner of this belt will be bound by his hands and by, by his feet. Warning him. And here it is. It's going to be bound. With two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he'd done and someone in the crowd shouted one thing and some another and since the commander could not get a truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. And what's so wild about this? So he's taken into the barracks. And uh, he is, a soldier realized um, when Paul was taken to the barracks when Paul asked, may I say something to you? And he goes, do you speak Greek? As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied, aren't you the Egyptian who started to revolt? They're mixing him up with somebody totally different. He says, um, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. And this is, Paul goes on to say about what's happening, and um, that goes into chapter 22. But the whole time, Paul did not lose his focus on what he was supposed to do, even when people were bum-rushing him. Even when they were arresting him, putting chains on him, he kept his focus because going forward, he has chains on for a while. <laughs> He's like, it's his new jewelry. They don't know, <laughs> you know, God bless him. It's just part of his deal. And... Um, I just, I'm just asking, you know, have you ever lost your focus totally and then realized one day, where did Jesus go? Jesus didn't go anywhere. It's where we go. Where would you go? What happened here? I just want to say, for me, my life has changed so much in the last two years. Like, totally 360 or whatever you want to call it. Like, I would, if somebody told me I would be where I am now, I'd be like, you lying. Because through the years of all the asking God questions, begging God to, like, what's going on, fighting with myself mostly, crying, trying to analyze what's going on with, you know, how come it's not going my way, 
A lot of it was, how come I don't have anybody in my life? How come it's nine years and I'm still nobody in my life? Be careful what you pray for. And then, then it's like I had to get right with me, meaning I had to let go of it. And when I truly let go, like truly let go, God said, here you go. It wasn't what I planned, I assure you. But God said, here you go. And then I fought it. I'm like, no, I don't, God. I don't know where I'm going. Yes, you are. I had to truly let go and trust God. I knew what he was doing. And I've said before, my pickers broke. Y'all got pick, your pickers broke. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, you make choices and you pick people in your life and it don't go well. And now in my life, I came from, and nothing, and I'm uh, not saying this to put this person down. It's just my experience because I still pray for this person almost every day. I went through a lot of emotional verbal abuse in this relationship and would pray that it, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. I know it's going to get better if I just do this, that, and the other thing. No, it's not. I, it's not up to me. I don't have the power. I don't have the control. So then when that ended, that nine years of questioning and asking and not believing God loves me and, I, okay, I'm just going to be alone. And then my, my prayer started to change. When your attitude changed, your prayers would change. Paul kept praying. He always praised God. He keeps chained. I don't know if I pray, I pray God if I'm chained up. I'm just saying. And here, I thought I was chained up. I thought I was bound because I was still bound to the past. And until I let totally go, God unveiled a person. I'm sorry. God unveiled a person. <laughs> very tall person and he said here you go and I will say that's the biggest blessing in my life because I went from a very dysfunctional to I don't trust it because it's too good relationship keep waiting for that shoe to drop kind of thing it ain't dropped it's almost two years it hadn't dropped yet I keep waiting, like, it's going to mess up. No. It keeps getting blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. And I take that experience and I learn. And so Acts 21 reminded me to stay open to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to have obstacles in my life. And I'm going to make choices that I shouldn't make. And I'm going to behave in ways that I shouldn't behave in. But I do have a choice. My choice is do I choose to whine and complain over and over and over, day in, day out? Or do I give myself a limited time to express and then get going, moving forward? Because I believe you do need to express yourself. You need to get rid of it. I give myself 24 hours to do all that complaining and whining and all that stuff, and then that's it. The next day is a new day, and I, I need to move forward in my mind. I'm just going to close with, with a question. What are you willing to do for Jesus today, tomorrow, the next day in your life? What are you willing to stop doing to open yourself up to doing for Christ? 
Sometimes we need to totally be alone at home because it's one thing, yes, we're in church and yeah, this is what you're supposed to say, whatever. But when I'm driving home, am I focusing on what I just heard today or am I thinking about, hmm, what am I having lunch? Am I going to go this, going to do that? Way? Like, am I giving God enough time of my life? It, it, and this has come from me. If you ain't talking to God through your whole day, you're missing out on some good conversation. Because I'm forever telling him about everything. He's probably just tired of me already. But I'm telling him about everything. But I had to get to that point to do that for me. And then sometimes I'm complaining a lot. But, you know, I'm his child. He knows I'm not perfect. But what, to make the time for yourself with your father, even if it's just not saying anything at all and receiving. I'm just asking if you could take a moment to do that for yourself and for God. Amen? All right, Jonathan is going to come up. Pastor Nate's going to come up. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> uh, oh. Oh, he can pray.